Hello, everyone. I'm Maria Raquel Bozzi, Senior Director of Education and International Initiatives at Film Independent. Welcome to this very special conversation on the life ahead with esteemed director Eduardo Ponti. But before we start, as usual, I would like to thank our lead sponsor, the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, and our virtual screening partner, Vision Media. And now, welcome, Eduardo. Congratulations, and thank you for sharing your film with us and our international audiences joining us today. How are you? Thank you. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here and share this, this movie with you all. Thank you for having me. So I, uh, you have made such a beautiful film about friendship, community, love, resilience, which just happened to have premiered this weekend globally. And, yes. you know, it's so fitting in this film that brings together so many cultures that it was a global premiere. How are you feeling? It's Monday after the opening weekend. I know it's really, you know, we're, we're overwhelmed and overjoyed. That's really the feelings. And what is really beautiful is the movie talks about the importance of coming together, the importance of being seen, the importance of being heard. And what is beautiful is how we're hearing and seeing the reactions of uh, people all over the world and how these reactions not only are in concert with one another, very similar to one another, but at the same time, very different from one another. So it's a beautiful way of seeing the amazing diversity of people around the world, but at the same time that we have so many similarities in how we humanly react to certain things. So it's been an amazing, amazing experience to be able to see and feel the reactions of people around 190 countries. That, that, is, that is really beautiful. It's kind of this, one of the silver linings of, of the conditions we're living in right now. And, and you know, we, we have to embrace that and, and find uh, the beauty in that. Um, I understand uh, that the film is based on, on a novel by Roman Gehrig uh, in 1975, The Life Before Us, which was made into a movie in 1977, Madame Rosa. Uh, when did you, uh, for full disclosure, I haven't read the book and I haven't seen the film. So I, you know, went into the film uh, with a clean slate and I'm glad I did. Uh, so when did you first become aware of the book and how soon after did you know you really wanted to adapt the book uh, into a contemporary version of it for the screen? Yeah, you know, you were breaking up, so I'm not sure I heard the full question. But 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 you know, the 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 book, the La Vie de Vensois, was one that I had on my nightstand ever since I was a teenager. It was something that I felt one day I wanted to do, and and the reason why is, a, it it it, it tells this such a heartbreaking, beautiful story in between two people that everything separates: uh, race, religion culture, generation, and yet really in the end, they're two sides of the same coin because they're both survivors and they've been raised both in the streets and they've been defined and marked by pain and suffering, but also this resilience, as you say, that was the first thing. And the second thing that was very important to me was, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, of course I can. Yeah, yeah, sorry. And because the, the image froze, so I wasn't sure. And the second thing that was very important to me, which was really, it was how Romain Gary told the story through the point of view of this 12 year old child. And that was something that really inspired me because to be able to tell a story through the point of view of another person, a 12 year old immigrant child, to be able to experience life through their eyes is really the beginning of empathy. And I thought it was very important for me to, um, it, it was something so, so heartwarming to, to be able to share the adventures of this child, but watching the experience through his eyes. And that was to be very special. Yeah, and, and I found that that experience so relevant for the moment we're going through when there's some, this refugee crisis worldwide where children have been left uh, to their own devices and how uh, some uh, found, find this way of connecting somehow or somehow there's people wanting to connect with them and help them. 
So I think that the film really captures that really beautifully. Um, I, of course, find one of the most remarkable uh, aspects of the film are the performances by Sophia Loren as Rosa, who happens to be your mom. <laughs> and Ibrahim, happens. She, she, you know. <laughs> uh, happens. Yeah, and Ibrahim Agüey, as, is that the way you say his last name, Agüey? Gueye, Gueye. As Momo. I mean, what a beautiful relationship. Uh, I, I love the subtle ways in which it unfolds and evolves. You know, it's a little smile, you know, a look that goes a little long. I mean, that relationship, the way it's kind of building and evolving is really beautiful. But, you know, I noticed that these are talents that are both at opposite ends of their career. One is a very legendary movie star who, by the way, her best telling is that she never comes across as a movie star. And the other one is just a debut performance. So how do you how do you build this very organic relationship with two people who are the opposite spectrums of their career? I mean, it is, this is you, the director, building that with two very yeah. different levels of experience. How did you do that? Well, I think that you first cast people that you feel energetically and emotionally will be able to connect. So the, the first and foremost, you have to find two people that have chemistry, that already like each other. When my mother saw Ibra for the first time, when he came to meet her, she burst out crying. The first time she met him, the first 10 seconds, she burst out crying. She was so taken with him and the heart in his eyes and the light in his eyes and his soul, she burst out crying. And then it was a matter of them knowing each other in such a way that they could have a relationship that wasn't based on you're Sophia Loren, the icon, and I'm Ibra, and I just started. And so we all lived together. For the totality of the shoot, we lived together so that he could see my mother the way that I saw my mother in the morning, uh, going to bed. Uh, having breakfast, sharing coffee, sharing conversation, sometimes just sitting together, watching uh, the ocean, not saying a word, just sitting next to each other. And that created that bond that allowed him to be able to, to have this, 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 this very strong connection with her at the same level because he, was, he knew my mother the way that I know her. It wasn't about the diva. It wasn't about the star. It was about Sophia, not with a PH, but with an F, the way that she was born. Oh, I, I love what you're saying because that's exactly what I appreciated and noticed. That, that relationship that is very subtle, it's not at all expressed in words. It's, it's very like a lived experience. So it absolutely comes through in that, in that way. Where, where, also, may I, add, may I add, Maria, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. May I add, uh, and another thing that really helped was that Ibra has amazing instincts. So that the hardest thing for Ibra was for, because he had so much heart that the second half of the movie, when he really starts to build the connection, that was something that was very much how he is in life, really. The hard part for him was to be really mean and rude to my mother at the beginning of the movie. And that was very hard for him. And so what he, and as we were rehearsing, those things weren't really meshing completely. But one day he had the amazing instinct of walking up to my mother, Ibra did, without me saying a word, walking up to my mother and saying, Sophia, I have to tell you, every time I come home after these rehearsals, when I have to be rude to you, it really breaks my heart. So can you, can, can you give me permission to be rude to you? And my mother looked at him and said, well, absolutely. You can say whatever you want because we're acting and I'll never get hurt. And from that day on, he was the rudest kid with my mother. And I could not have been happier. Oh, my God. I... And he has those instincts. He has, he has that instinct. He, he has these, in, these actors' instincts that are unbelievable. You know, and he doesn't come from, from a city where you would think, you know, say that if a, a, a boy is raised in, say, Beverly Hills or Santa Monica or America, you feel like maybe he heard something like this. But this boy was born in Senegal, moved to, uh, to Italy six years ago. You know, all these tricks, all these instincts of acting, he, he, he got them from himself. He was born with those. And that was unbelievable to me.
beautiful. What a, what a treasure. Where did you find him? How was the casting? Where, where, where did you find him? Yeah, guys? well, he was, you know, he was, I, I, I scanned, you know, 350 children uh, to meet, uh, to meet uh, uh, um, uh, Ibra. And he was the one that really caught my eye because the part of the audition was to do an improv on on him trying to sell me the candlesticks that he had stolen. So the the scene was he walks into the audition room and he has to sell me those candlesticks. And as he tried to walk into the audition room, the door got stuck. And any other kid at that point would have stopped the audition, reset, and he didn't. He used the getting stuck of the door to actually, he used it into the scene. And I thought, how interesting. He, you're never acted in your life and you have that instinct. And so after that, out of these 350 children, I picked four of them. And I gave these four an acting boot camp for, for four weeks to really understand how they would evolve. And, you know, he was just so gifted. He was, he was soaking it all up, understanding. And, and I did that because I wanted to give him the tools to be himself. Because that's what you do. I mean, in, in the end, I'm casting his soul. I'm casting his heart. And all I wanted was to be able to give him the tools so that he could be comfortable in front of the camera and just show the world who he was. And he soaked it all up. And he, I'm so, so, so proud of him. When I gave him the role, he looked at me and said, I will work so hard. Oh. I, it moves me because every time I speak about him, I, I get moved. So, I mean, oh, I, you know, but I, I love that this all comes through. All this hard work really comes through in a very yeah. understated way. So, bravo, bravissimo. Uh, also, also, bravo to him. Bravo to him. Yeah. The, the, the other kids, I mean, all the kids yeah. come very in an authentic and natural way. How do, how do you work? I mean, you had four kids at the very Yeah, well, what, what, what happened is that, uh, you know, uh, the, the, other, the other child, Yosef, was a runner-up to be Momo. Okay. And they started having such a good relationship in the four-week boot camp of, of the acting boot camp. They had such a good relationship that I really felt that they had a great energy together. And it's really, casting is all about energies. It's all about creating this mosaic of all these different energies together. And, and so they were so simpatico, they were so good together that I gave him a role. And, and for him, it was different because Momo really had to create a character. I mean, Ibra really creates a character. With Diego playing Yosef, I just wanted to find a boy and just whoever I found, that was going to be Yosef. He wasn't going to build a character. It was going to be Yosef. So what I did with him to make him feel comfortable is to, uh, I got the production designer to go to his house and the room that you see in our film is exactly his room with his posters, with everything. So he felt very much at home. And, and then Simone, the three-year-old, who was, who, was, who was, you know, who was incredible, his, his gift is that when I called action, he would never look at anybody else but the actors in the scene. He was so engrossed in what was happening in the scene that he never looked at anybody else. So I got very lucky with Simone because I tell you, for a, a, a three-year-old to be so focused in a scene is not easy. And he did a wonderful job. I was, I was very lucky. I really, they were wonderful, wonderful kids. Right. And then can you talk about directing uh, one of the most talented leading actors in the world uh, when the actor is your mom, uh, how how was that? And what did you want to? What did you know of her that you wanted to come out out in this yeah. movie? Yeah, what I love, uh, I love working with my mother, and this is the third movie that we do together. And I love it because we love risking together. We love pushing the envelope. We love to do things together that people are not prepared that they have never seen my mother do. And what I love also is to present my mother in a light that isn't the diva, that isn't the icon, that isn't Sophia Loren, because I'm not interested in that. And I don't know that person because who I know, who I know is who the person you have on the screen. Who I know is that woman. 
who I know is that woman with that irreverence, with that comedy, with that strength, with that heart. And I love my mother, of course, as a person, but as an artist so much that I just want to show that side. And because we have those similar objectives, and she loves to do that too. She wishes that she could work with, with in other films where she's allowed to completely be herself in that way, the way that she was maybe 40, 50 years ago in movies in Italy. And so she was, she was it, it was really, really wonderful. And, and also what is so commendable is her tirelessness. You know, I'm a, I'm a pain, I'm a pain. And, and, and I will not, and, and I won't let go. I won't give up until I get what I feel I need for the movie. And that means 10, 12, 15 takes and never once. And my mother could have made my love hell, my life hell. She could have said, Eduardo, you know what I mean? It's great. Never once, Enough. never once in 40 days, in 40 days did she tell me, Eduardo, basta, è finito. Never once. Because she understood that what we were trying to do was something authentic, delicate, and that it needed that space to grow. And that the first takes, we were just finding our way through. Uh, you know, it's, it's always very frustrating for me to speak about my mother because I can never find the words that capture truly what I feel inside. And, and it, it's just, you know, and, and maybe the only way to kind of capture it is just to say, it's just good for my soul. That's, that's what it is. That's beautiful. I have, I have one last question about actually the, the characters and, and, and the, the performances. Um, I really appreciated the trifecta of Rosa, Momo, and Lola. Uh, I think Gabriel Zamora brings a very fresh and genuine yes. vibe to the whole dynamic of the film. And she's, of course, a, a superb actor. I'm wondering if her character in the book was a transgender uh, person yes. or, uh, okay. I, I thought that maybe this was a decision that you made to make it even, to throw in even a more contemporary theme, which- No, 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 Lola, Lola is absolutely transgender in the book. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. okay. That, that's great. And, and what about, one last question I have, like uh, Ibra, did he have aspirations as an actor and what, what is he now? considering like a real full-blown career. I mean, this is kind of catapulting him. I'm sure everybody wants to work with him. He, you know what? He, he loves, you know, his, his two passions are soccer and acting. Those are his two passions. And, and, and he's, you know, he's, yeah, he would love to continue. He will continue. You know, I'm, I'm, he's now, he's now, I'm, I'm making sure that he's learning English because I told him that if he really wants a global career, he also has to learn English. So now we're going to put him through English classes. And I, and he, and he promised me that by next year, he'll, he'll, he'll be speaking English fluently. Now he's asked me, you know, we text every day, we speak to each other every day. And now he's asked me for the last five days, not to speak to him in Italian anymore. So now our conversations are quite brief because his English is not as good as, you know, but, but he's very, but it, it shows the kind of person that he is, you know, he, he just invests himself a thousand percent in everything. So now his new challenge is I have to learn English. And so that's his new thing because he wants to be able to have a career that spans not only Italy, but also any, you know, to be able to broaden the range of opportunities wherever those may come. But you know he's such good. He's so good, even without talking. That I think <laughs> he has a career no matter what. Just it's, yes, it's range. He's so amazing. Yes. Uh, let's let's talk about the adaptation process. Well, this was based in Paris first, and you took it to Italy, particularly Bar mm -hmm. uh, Bari. Um, Bari. Yeah. Why, why did you make that decision, and what is it about Italy that you wanted to to, to yeah. But Italy, really, the decision to move it to Italy was a decision that every time that I work with the actors, I, and especially with my mother, I want to give her the opportunity to be able to act in her native tongue, because it is only in her native tongue that she truly can display the, 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 the broadest range of her colors, not only in her native tongue, but I asked her to to, to act the movie in Neapolitan, which is not even Italian, it's an Italian dialect. Because really, it, you, you really feel, you know why? Because when you speak Neapolitan, the voice 
isn't born in the throat. It's born in the gut, in the belly. And it adds a level of grit to her character that in other languages she could not have had. So that was very important. Where is the voice born from? The voice in this movie has to be born from the belly, from the guts of the character. And so that's why I chose Neapolitan for her. And then, of course, Bari, because it is one of the biggest uh, southern towns in Italy. And it is very much like Belleville in Paris, a crossroads of different uh, ethnicities, different cultures, different kind of cultural colors. And so that was important to kind of have something that kind of ref reflected the, the, uh, the cultural makeup of Belleville in Paris. Oh, and, and you know, I, I think it's, it, it goes to what you're saying, this grit, this kind of coming from the belly. Uh, I think even though the film is beautifully shot, lovingly shot, and I can see the love of this place, this place in every frame, I appreciate that it's not a romanticized kind of precious view. Uh, it feels like a lived experience. Uh, so can you talk about, you know, your work with the cinematographer to achieve that lived kind of experience that you get? Yeah, I mean, you know what? Real doesn't have to be ugly. Real is beautiful. And you have to find the beauty in every aspect of, of a city, in every neighborhood, in every, in every corner. And you find beauty when you focus on the humanity, when you focus on the humanity of the characters, when you focus on the, on the humanity of a city, when you focus on the humanity of the architecture. And so it was really for me always going back to that, always going back to what is real, what is human, what is unvarnished, but what is, what is, what is to celebrate the humanity of people. And once you celebrate the humanity of people, you celebrate beauty. And when you celebrate beauty, you can't help but having a beautiful frame because it's there, it, it coexists, it's, it's baked in, it's baked in. And that was very, very important. So with, with, uh, with Angus, what I really wanted to, what, what we were very much inspired by, I must say, were, uh, were Latin American movies. Uh, Fernando Mereas' City of God, Hector Babenko's uh, Pichote, to, to that energy, that, that, that life can't help but be vital and big and colorful. And no matter how much suffering there is, uh, there is always a smile around the corner because that's what happens. That's what happens, you know? And, 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 and to kind of try to imbue the frame with that kind of chromatic intensity, uh, with that, with that energy was was important because that's how these characters feel inside they're brimming with life they're spilling over with life yeah and i i can see the influences actually you refer to um mm. the city of god is one of my favorite movies and i i could see that influence ah, yeah. in your film uh, let's talk about the writing process you uh adapted this with uh ugo chiti how was the collaboration and what uh, how, what, do you, what was your approach to the material in, t in terms of making it more contemporary and what you wanted to keep and what you wanted to let go? Yeah, well, you know, it, it was, uh, Ugo is a master. Ugo works a lot with Matteo Garrone, uh, mm -hmm. you know, one of the greatest Italian filmmakers working today. He wrote with him Dogman and he wrote with him Gomorra. So he, he, really, he really is a wonderful, wonderful uh, a writer, uh, but not only of dramas. You know, what's great about Ugo is that he's very funny. And for me, it was important to imbue this movie with, 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 with the, the drama was baked in. You, you, you cannot remove the drama from my movie. But one of my rules was you never sacrifice a joke. You never sacrifice a comedic moment because those allow the, the viewer to then absorb all the rest in a way that is, is not uh, overwhelming, but that is slowly you kind of, you know, you let your guard down with the comedy and then unbeknownst to yourself, you let the, you let the emotion in. And, um, and, and, so, and so it was really, we talked a lot about that tone, how to walk that line uh, that was very important. And then, you know, um, we really, we, we, we were laser focused on focusing on 
the heart of the movie, which is the relationship between Momo and Madame Rosa. So like anything, when you adapt a movie, uh, a book into a movie, you sacrifice things that you love in the book, but that don't quite, you know, can, can it's, it, it's hard to put everything in. So for us, our, our decision was to very much focus on the relationship. And so that was our line. That was our blueprint. So we made the decisions according to that. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Makes total sense. Now, you grew up uh, immersed in a world of film royalty, like your dad, Carlo Ponti, of course, was one of the most prolific producers of the 20th century. He collaborated with masters like Bellini, David Lean, Antonioni. Um, and I, you know, you grew up, of course, now we already discussed your mom. Uh, what are your memories of, of, of growing in that and immersing that environment? And was film always a given for you? Like this is your world. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? And yeah, you know, I've uh, you know, I've, I've I've obviously heard many times the concept of film royalty, but the truth is, that's not how I see my parents. We and that's not how they see themselves. They see themselves as film uh, film artisans. That's really how they see themselves. We're you know there we we are part of a great craft, which is filmmaking, and 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 so and because of that, I was not raised around movie sets and movie stars because that's not who they are. I was I was raised in a household where we talked about stories, we talked about the craft, but we talked about it in a very grounded way not in, a, in any kind of, you know, glamorous, it, it really wasn't that. I mean, of course, to sell a movie, you have to embrace glamour. Absolutely. Sophia Loren is an extremely glamorous person. Carlo Ponti was an extremely glamorous person. But that was when you sell a movie. But at home, that way, that, that's not at all what they brought at home. Because to, to them, they understood that that's something you do to sell a movie. But when you're at home, you don't, you know, believe your hype. You just are a human being committed, dedicated to something you love, which happens to be storytelling. And that was the lessons that we were taught at home. It's so refreshing to hear you saying that for someone who grew up in South America, for me, they were royalty. Watching these movies that I was watching, oh my God, and seeing them you know, in events, in festivals. Um, I understand that... Um, Antonioni uh, was an Robert Allman, you count them as mentors. Uh, yes. What did you learn from them? And, and what advice did they give you that you kind of took on? What I, what I learned from Antonioni is like, I, I was, I'll, I'll tell you something. I was, as I was preparing this webinar, I was concerned because there was a blower outside my window and it was making a big noise. And that blower reminded me of a, an episode I, I lived with uh, Michelangelo. I, yeah. was, I was fortunate enough to be his assistant for a brief period of time. He was, it was later in his career. He had already suffered his stroke. Uh -huh. And we were preparing a movie here as I was a college student. And my job was literally to read the script to him because it was hard for him to read. He was completely conscious, but it was hard for him. So I would read to him the script. He was staying in this house in Los of at least. And I was just reading the script. His mind veered because he heard this blower and he looked outside and the frame of, of what he was looking outside was as of this gardener blowing these leaves and the leaves were sweeping up into the air and the frame looked like an Antonioni frame. And I looked at him and I said, ti piace, eh? like you like this frame. And he looked at me and he couldn't speak anymore. And he just did this to say, I love it so much. What I learned from him was his curiosity. What I learned from him is no matter how old you are, you have to learn about life. You have to love life. You have to be interested. You cannot be jaded. You cannot be cynical. You cannot be skeptical. You just have to embrace it no matter how old you are, no matter how many experiences, no matter whether you feel like you've lived a thousand lives, then you're going to live a thousand and one. And that's what Michelangelo taught me. Yeah. I mean, and he was painting at the end of his life. I mean, I saw 
when he came, he, maybe that's when you were working with him, he had a retrospective at LACMA. And for me, one that's been one of the biggest fan moments for me to see Antonioni, even though he couldn't speak, to see him on stage was like, oh my God, uh, it, it yeah. was so beautiful. Yeah. Um, I could keep talking to you forever, but people are gonna kill me now because there's questions here. So sure. let's give a chance to other people. Um, yes. Here's a question from Jonathan Schwartz. Uh, he says, I enjoyed this film and the 1978 film, Madame Rosa, on which this film is based. Uh, did you watch the original version before working on this one? And how does working, uh, uh, the other one, uh, it's about your mother, which we already covered. Yeah. Let's talk so about I, I, yeah, I saw, I saw and admired very much the 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 movie, um, Madame Rosa. I saw it when I was a teenager, and then I saw it again in my uh, again. I saw it once when I was fifteen, I believe, and once when I was eighteen. But because our movie is not based on the on the on on that film, it's based on the book. You know, I didn't want to re re revisit that because because that's not our source material. Our source material is the book. Well, it is an adaptation, not a remake of another movie. That Correct. Makes brava, brava, Maria. Echo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, here's a question from Josh. Um, I saw in the credits that you have a number of producers, Regina Scully, Geraldine Dreyfus, and Jamie Wolf, who are very well-known producers of great documentary films. Can you talk a bit about how your producing team came together? Yeah. Well, I've known Geraldine and Linda and Regina for many, many years. I've been great fans of their documentaries. They're, they they really produce work that is so important for our society and for the world. And so I thought that maybe this is the kind of movie that they might be interested in because, of course, it deals with very similar themes as their documentaries, you know, uh, tolerance, uh, immigration, uh, a sense of inclusion. And, uh, and, and, and they did, they, they responded to it. And I was really blessed to have them on uh, this team. Great, uh, here's a question from uh, Lisa Oropesa, but I, that question was already answered. Lisa, I hope you heard the answer. It was during our conversation. Uh, uh, Carol asked that Netflix has a dubbed version. Where can we watch the film in original language? It is absolutely also on Netflix. All you need to do is to click on the audio tab and you go to original language Italian. And then if you need subtitles, you can go to subtitles. The movie is, is playing on Netflix simultaneously in all the languages, including of course the original, because that's very important because that's the intended version. We just got for free a little Netflix language versions tutorial here. So good. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, um, do your Jeffrey Fenner says your mom hadn't worked in a number of years. Did you have to convince her to come out of retirement to do this film? Because just because you retired, <laughs> you know what? An actor never considers themselves <laughs> retired, never ever. And uh, she was just waiting for a good role. She was we were just waiting for something that inspired her that she could really sink her her creative teeth in, you know, and and uh. And, uh, and we, we love working together. And it was just, uh, you know, uh, to find the right project that we could really embrace together. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm curious, I, I was reading uh, that you uh, went to USC uh, School of Cinematic Arts uh, and, you know, with, with such a legacy and, you know- You're breaking up. I'm not, I don't know if you're hearing me, but I'm not hearing you. Oh, okay, I can hear you. Uh, my question is, uh, I, uh, now I can hear you. Yes. Uh, it's like you chose, you know, having again, grown up immersed in, in, in the world of cinema, as you say, in a very domestic yes. life way, uh, you chose to come to, to the States, uh, for, for film school to the USC school of cinema. Yeah. Um, why did you want to come study in Los Angeles? Uh, you might see an, an obvious question for people who are not growing, you know, immersed in cinema. So, but mm. for you, what was that about? Because, you, you know what? That was, that was thanks to my father. My father loved America. My father was an enormous, uh, an enormous admirer of America, its values. And so it was always a dream for him to have his children study in America. 
And, and I'm very grateful to him because it gave, it allowed me to have a mentality that wasn't only Eurocentric, but more global. So that when I make a movie, you know, I'm, I have one foot in a European sensibility and the other foot always in a certain American sensibility. And so it was something that I think was, was really wonderful uh, for him to bestow that passion on both my brother and me. That, that, that's great. But he, he also worked in the States, right? Your father worked uh, in the United States as well. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, I mean, my mother worked also in, in the oh, United States. Both, both, both worked. Uh, yeah, I mean, my father, of course, produced Dr. Givago, which so is uh, an American film. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, this is your third feature. Uh, how has this project differed from past projects that you, that you have made? And how has... Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's, uh, I mean, as I said, you know, filmmaking is a craft. Uh, you, you start at a certain level and then every movie, every experience enriches you, deepens you, makes you more mature as a filmmaker, but also as a human being. I think that I've always been interested in movies and in, and in, uh, and in subject matters that required me to be older in a sense, to be able to handle them in a way that was balanced. And, um, and so it was a gift for me to be able to make this movie at, uh, at, uh, at the 46, because earlier it would have been hard for me to embrace these themes and to handle all these different colors, you know, emotional colors in a way that was, that was delicate and right. And so I'm, I'm very grateful that I was able to do it now. When, when you start having a better sense of life, of people. And also, you, you know what? You relax, you relax. I'm more relaxed. I let the actors do their thing. You know what I mean? I don't micromanage. I'm still a pain, but I don't micromanage. I let them do their thing. I trust them. It's such a relief to be able to trust, to get to a point in your life, in your maturity, that you allow yourself to trust the excellence of others and that you don't feel that you always need to be the one giving all the answers. No, ask the right question. That sometimes is more important for a director to ask the person the right question rather than giving the right answer. I can relate to that sense of belief that uh, your 40s bring like, okay, yes. you know, I don't have to know, I don't have to know at all. It's like, oh. okay, to, it's okay. Yes. <laughs> feel. Like, yes. Uh, um, then I, you, you spoke beautifully about what you learned uh, without him kind of teaching you from Antonioni. Uh, what advice from uh, your years making movies do you have for um, up and coming filmmakers, for, for young filmmakers coming up? You know, it's, 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 uh, it's don't give up. Don't give up you know, and, and try not to have a plan B. Because if you have a plan B, you're gonna be tempted to use it. Don't give up, just keep on going. Just keep on telling your stories. You know, it's a, it's a f filmmaking is a craft, it's a muscle, exercise that muscle, the way that you work out in the gym, work out telling stories, pick up the camera, write, create moments. Enjoy creating moments in your life on the page. Don't think, oh my God, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to write the most beautiful, most famous movie in the world. It's a waste of time. Sit down and say, I'm going to create one scene that is a moment that can touch me or that can make me laugh or that can inspire me. One moment. And then add to that moment another and then another and then another. And slowly and surely, you'll have a movie and try to work on your art, on your craft every day. Every day. Because for all the people that don't work on it every day, there are a thousand more that are working on it every day. And so if you're passionate, you have to keep on doing it every day. It's a muscle. It's a craft. The heart is a muscle. Making a film is a muscle. You got to work on it every day. And how do you do that every day, Eduardo? How do you exercise? Well, you, have, you know, I have, I have a family, so you have to make time. 
and it has to be a priority. You know, you, you know, life is complicated and uh, life, uh, you know, you need to have a lot of priorities and that's why you juggle, but you got to dedicate the time. You know, you cannot let, you know, the other thing, which is very important when you start writing, turn off the internet, just turn it off. Because <laughs> No, because if you don't turn off the internet, you're going to be bombarded by a thousand notifications and you will not write one scene, one line. So have the discipline to turn off the internet, have the discipline to say, you know, uh, the great Alberto Moravia, the Italian author, would work every day from nine to noon. Right, every day from nine to noon. So have that discipline. You don't have to do it three hours a day, but do it whatever, however many time you can. Of course, it, it can be 30 minutes, but 30 minutes every day starts to add up. So two things, set up a time and turn off the internet. Turn the phone, put the phone in a drawer. You can't even hear it buzz because then if you hear it buzz, you're going to be attracted to it. Turn it off, put it somewhere you can't hear and give yourself that time for 30 minutes, for an hour, for three hours, whatever you can do to do that. And slowly you start creating not only a work, but you start knowing yourself. You start understanding what am I good at? What am I not so good at? And the things that you're not so good at, get help. You don't have to do everything yourself. Get help. Get a co-writer. You don't have to write everything you, yourself. You don't have to have the idea that's going to re re revolutionize the, the world. Find a book. Find a way to maybe contact the author. Not every author is John Grisham. Not every author is Stephen King. Things Some authors would love to collaborate with a young writer and see if that, that book can be turned into a movie. Find, be, be, be resourceful trust yourself and don't give up that's great advice and i would have ended there is the perfect place to end but a funny question came up which i think is you either finish grand or with a funny question and uh this one is uh, i am a product of immigrants too when you were young and misbehaved in what language did your parents discipline you only in italian And what, what was that? <laughs> Only in Italian. Oh, and, and uh, what was that? Well, the, whatever that situation was, but I always got disciplined in Italian. Okay, okay, great. You discipline your kids in English, right? <laughs> uh, no, you know what? I disciplined them in Italian as well, come to think of it. It's true. You know what? I never thought of that, but I, I guess I do it too, in Italian. It comes out in Italian, okay. Uh, yeah, it comes out in Italian, <laughs> yeah. It is so great to meet you, Eduardo. You too, and, uh, uh, I'm so happy the film is resonating with audiences worldwide. And I, I wish you luck with future projects. Thank you. Thank for you so much. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. See you soon. Ciao. Okay, bye bye.